Welcome to the last day of the ACM Reflections Projections Conference of 2006. Um, our next speaker doesn't need any introduction. He is an airplane enthusiast. But you'll so you'll do it anyway, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> airplane enthusiast and self-proclaimed sex symbol. But most importantly, he's one of the leading technology journalists in our country. He's appeared in the New York Times, Newsweek, and Forbes, among others. Uh, he's also a star in TV shows, um, PBS, Triumph of the Nerds, Electric Money, and Nerd TV. Uh, Mr. Crinchlow is here today to talk to us about the key to success. And he's also asked me to announce that he's not wearing any underwear. So let's give him a big round of applause. What can I say? How does she know that? <laughs> I'm Bob Cringely. I'm really happy to be here. I want to thank you people for getting up at what must be nearly midnight uh, or, or nearly last night for some of you. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. My first time at an ACM conference and I didn't quite know what to do because uh, usually I'm just called on to you know, tell jokes and old stories. And, and then I got here and they said, I asked what I was supposed to do and they said, well, tell jokes and old stories. So I guess I'll do that. Uh, 30 years ago today, I was uh, in a hotel in Beirut, Lebanon. I was at nearing the end of what turned out to be 13 months of work in Beirut, working as a war correspondent. There was mortar fire. Uh, we were in the second day of mortar fire. The first day, the uh, bar had run dry. And when the bar runs dry and you're under fire, you know, you see your life in a, new, in a new perspective. And I began to question what I was doing there, which was a good question to have. Um, I had started my career as a physicist. Physicist to Beirut was an odd transition, but I was a bad physicist. And I had to face that fact, and so I did something that I could get paid for, which was be a war correspondent. So I went to a bunch of places in the 70s, Angola, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Northern Ireland, kneecappings in Italy, ultimately Beirut. And I decided that I was at a turning point in my career, and I was facing two job offers. I could go to Nicaragua, cover the Sandinistas, or I could go to Stanford University. Nicaragua, Stanford University. I made the non-obvious choice. I went to California. <laughs> and in California, I um, joined the Homebrew Computer Club, the world's second personal computer club. The first was in New Jersey. People don't know that, but it's true. And there I met two guys named Steve, Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. And they offered me um, a job. At the time, Steve Jobs had hair down to here, and he only ate fruit. And he said to me, we don't have much loot. So we'd like to pay you in stock. I held out for the cash. <laughs> so I uh, did a lot of early uh, engineering work at Apple, helped build the prototype computers, um, wrote the manual, then they fired me. Went back to Stanford, came back to, um, came back to Apple in 1980, I worked on a team that did the graphical user interface for the Lisa. Any of you remember the Lisa? Lisa was a very uh, early graphical workstation. It was based on technology stolen from Xerox. I was there for the theft. And it was a very interesting time. We were developing um, a, uh, a commercial graphical workstation that was the first of its type. You know, there had been Xerox Alto, for example. Uh, that had been sold, it had never been sold. The Alto was built for use in Xerox, Xerox Park or for use as trade goods, interestingly enough. Uh, but it was never a commercial product. There was a Xerox product called the Star that came out around there, but it was not terribly successful. We were trying to do the Lisa, which proved not to be terribly successful either. But uh, I was on the team that did the graphical user interface. And my, uh, my only contribution was the trash can icon which I invented. And uh, I invented the trash can icon because I had written a book 
I worked as a consultant to the Presidential Commission that investigated the Three Mile Island nuclear accident because I had been a bad physicist. And after uh, spending uh, a summer wearing a dosimeter in Harrisburg, I went home and wrote a book about the accident. And I used the only, um, the only word processor I, I had at the time was an IBM 370-168 mainframe. So I wrote it in a line editor. And late one night, I hit the wrong key on my ADM 3A terminal. It all went away. I lost 8,000 lines, 96,000 words. So I ran to the help desk. The guy at the help desk was an English major. And I explained my problem, and he explained to me that Lawrence of Arabia had written his book, The Seven Pillars of Wisdom, longhand, 230,000 words long, and had lost the manuscript on a train platform in London. And there was no backup tape for him either. <laughs> so I had to start all over. In retrospect, it was good, but then, you know, so was an enema. So I, when it came time to do the trash can icon, I, I realized that uh, I wanted to save people from themselves. So I, 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 my only contribution to computer science, uh, you know, I have to flaunt it here because it's the only one I've got, uh, is that I did this thing and I forced it to be a two-step process where you put the, uh, the file in the, in the trash can and later on you empty the trash. And, and, but you have to have some way of indicating that there's something in the trash can. And, you know, if you were a Macintosh user in, in later Macs, they, they made the trash can bulge. Violates the laws of physics. <laughs> After that, if something was in the trash, the trash, the lid was off. Violates the laws of my mother. <laughs> uh, in uh, Windows, they have this uh, uh, cleverly named uh, uh, trash can-like uh, recycle bin that actually has pieces of crumpled paper in it when there's something in it, which, you know, makes uncharacteristic sense for Redmond, but uh, we didn't have any of that. None of that existed. So what I did was I, I animated a fly that flew around the top <laughs> of, the, of the trash can. And we did, we did early focus groups and we showed, showed people the Lisa and they liked the computer, but they loved the fly. You know, they loved the fly. The only problem was, if you turned the fly off, the computer was twice as fast. <laughs> So then they fired me. And I went away and was brought back by Apple one last time, 1984, to work on a team that uh, did uh, built for Apple a global communication system. The idea was to have a, a system for communicating uh, with uh, large customers, uh, uh, developers, um, suppliers, uh, within the company itself. It was a graphically based sort of Macintosh-like system that would allow exchange of files, would allow chat, would allow email, would allow all these sorts of things. And this was, uh, it was very much like the World Wide Web, only it predated the World Wide Web by a number of years. And so we built this thing, which was called Apple Link. And it ran for a number of years, it was quite successful, and ultimately we sold it to the, or Apple sold it, to the people who ran the mainframes that it ran on. It was a company called Quantum Computer Services. And Quantum then changed its name to America Online. So I helped write AOL 1.0. And one of the, uh, one of the features of, of Apple Link was a mail client that allowed you to send mail and change your mind. It's very similar to the trash can. Think about this. So you could send mail and say, did I really mean to send that? No, get it back. You know? and, and I thought this was cool. So I would demonstrate it to employees, especially to be an employee who, was, who had been working for like three days. And they'd be there. I'd send a message at the time. The CEO was John Scully. Send a message to Scully. Say, Scully, you suck. Send it off. And then, you know, the employees getting ready to pack up all their goods and put it in a little box and leave because they were going to be fired. They knew it. And I'd say, no, look, I can bring it back. Just touch this. Comes right back. It was cool. Except then one day Scully checked his mail at just the right time. <laughs> and then they fired me. So after that, um, I worked and helped uh, a number of companies. Um, over the years, I've, I've done a lot of writing because that's the thing I always did, but I've also worked uh, uh, inside a variety of companies, some startups, some not, uh, some successful, some not, some I owned, some I didn't. And uh, usually the unsuccessful ones were the ones I owned for some reason. 
But uh, nevertheless, I was uh, fairly involved in the founding of a number of companies that you may have heard of. Um, like, uh, I, my successes were, were definitely front-loaded, by the way. And so I, I, I was there at the founding of Apple. Um, I, was, uh, I was there at the founding of uh, Cisco Systems, which was founded in my office, interestingly enough. And uh, I was uh, there uh, very, very shortly after the founding of Adobe Systems. And then in the Internet era, I helped found a company called Excite that you may remember came and went, but it, at one point it was worth $6.7 billion. And, uh, and I helped uh, a company called Elon, it's still around, help them get going. And a few, a few others. The Elon story is very interesting because I knew the founders of Elon and I, was, I, was, uh, I had lunch with them one day and I said, how's it going? And I said, it's great except we're shutting the company down this afternoon. And, well, why, why, is, why is that? Well, we don't have, it's payday, we don't have the money to pay the people, so therefore we're going to shut the company down and call it a day. And this is sort of startup culture, you know, burn rate. Burn rate is everything. And I said, well, you know, how much is the payroll? And they said how much the payroll was. And I said, well, I'll pay it. So I paid the payroll for Elon for one, one week, uh, way back when. And, you know, at, some, at one point I, I, they get, sent me a little stock, I sold it, bought a $1.2 million house, you know? So my return on equity there, you know, return on investment was pretty good. I feel good about e-loan. But I went not long ago to get a loan from e-loan, and they turned me down. <laughs> and I said, don't you understand it? I saved your company. They said, we don't care. You know, you're not credit worthy. So I'm here to talk about startups because I've had a great deal to do with a bunch of them beyond the ones that I, I talked about and I've written about them a fair amount. And there's a great interest in startups here from talking to people, especially because I think Max Levchin was here yesterday and, uh, and uh, Jawed talked last night. And, you know, it's, it's very exciting. Guys work hard for a few months and, you know, get a billion and a half bucks. Oh, that's great. Let's all do that. If everyone in this room did that, we'd have an even better building. But you know, the funny thing is, it doesn't actually work that way. Uh, what's the success rate of startups? Or what, rather, what's the failure rate? I'm sorry? That depends upon where you measure it. You know, I like to use the, I like to use the rounder term, 95%. <laughs> if you go from initial idea, you know, napkin, too much Coke of any kind, um, <laughs> Uh, I'd say 95%. Maybe it's 85, maybe it's 80%. It's huge. More fail than succeed. Most of these failures, however, are pre-funding. You know, most of them just never get any money from anyone. And so if we looked at, at, at ones that, that are funded and still fail, depending upon your definition of failure, it's probably 30 to 40% range, which isn't bad you know, if you think about it. Nevertheless, most fail. And they fail for a variety of reasons. And the reasons that they fail are not the ones you're thinking about right now. They don't fail because they have bad ideas. I mean, some do. They don't fail because they had bad technology. I mean, some do. You know, they don't fail because they were started by idiots. Oh, some do. But most of them fail because of um, personality issues in the company because of scalability issues, either in the technology or, more likely, the business model. Or they fail because of, uh, gosh, there's so many other reasons. There, there, there really are. It, it's amazing, but the biggest reason of all is probably timing. Now, <clears throat> at the end of this thing, I'm going to give you a presentation of, of my startup. Everyone's got one. You know, don't you have two or three? Yeah. Everyone's got one. I've got one. And, and, and timing is a factor in all of this. Timing is a factor in my startup as well. And you'll see something very interesting. Because most startups, we have, we have a huge, startups are, are, are all a part of predicting the future. If we're going to predict the future, there, there are very few things we know about predicting the future, for sure. One is that we tend to overestimate change in the short term and underestimate it in the long term which means that timing is critical. 
If you're starting a startup, you have only so much time, money, and brain cells to devote. At some point, you're going to run out of one of those three things. And if the opportunity hasn't been realized, either because it took too long to develop or it took the market too long to develop, you're going to lose. So a lot of, a lot of a successful startup culture is managing failure and avoiding it. You know, success is easy. Success just takes intelligence and, and hard work. And this room is full of intelligence and hard work. Any one of you could make a successful company. But to do it at the right time, in the right place, with the right partners, under the right circumstances, in the right market situation, you know, under the right, you know, I don't know, celestial sign, something like that. These, these are the really, really hard parts. So what we tend to do is, living in academia here, we're living in the future. We're thinking in the future. We're, you know, at Xerox Park, I worked for a short time at Xerox Park, and when I worked, they fired me. And uh, when, I, when I worked at Xerox Park, the thing that I, I, I loved about it was that they consciously chose to live and work 10 years in the future. They made a decision. And, you know, think about what those guys invented between 1970 and 1975. They invented everything we value today in computer science. And they did it because they just said, what's the world going to look like 10 years from now? We don't care how much it costs to, to create that world, but we're within our walls. We're going to create that. So we're going we're to have computers that, my first computer was an Apple I. It had 4K of RAM. At that same time, at Xerox, they had multi-megabit machines. You know, that difference is crucial. They had, there were no graphical displays. They had graphical displays. There was no networking. They had networking. There was no, uh, you know, uh, 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 postscript-like uh, page description language. They had Mesa, which was its equivalent. And, and those things existed there, and they functioned in that environment, and they made mistakes, and they learned things where they weren't having to make the mistakes in the marketplace. Xerox spent tons and tons of money, and people think, oh, it was a failure. The failure got them a $10 billion uh, laser printer business. I don't think that's a failure. What it didn't get them was the Ethernet business. It didn't get them the graphical workstation business. Okay, who cares? It got them a $10 billion laser printer business. I'd say it was a worthwhile return on investment. But they were living in the future, and they, and they, they knew what was good and bad about it, and they were ready, or other people were ready. The people themselves were ready when they spun off all these companies to create startups to, to leverage what they knew was coming. As academics, we live, you live, in the future as well. And you can see, you can say, whoa, this is great, this is great. I, you know, if only we did this, that would be perfect. And it's, you know, it's trivial. I've heard that, that word a lot this weekend. Oh, it's technically trivial. Why didn't you do it? Well, it's trivial, you know, I'm, I'm going to have a beer. Well, maybe it is technically trivial. A lot, a lot of ideas are. But you implement them, and, and, and whether it's trivial or complex, whether it's hard or easy, whether it's expensive or cheap, if the market's not ready, the company's not going to succeed. And so timing, if you're already living in the future, you're ahead of the market. You have to be ahead of the market to a certain extent in order to make things work. But if you're too far ahead of the market, it never works. I'm going to give you a presentation shortly for a technology that was invented 11 years ago and the market just caught up. 11 years. And this happens a lot of the time. I lost my life savings creating a content distribution network that would be perfect for today, except today is not 1993. You know, I just, I just got carried away. I said, oh, let's do this. Let's spend a lot of money. And we did it, and it has characteristics that are, that are not available in CDNs today that ought to be, but, you know, oh well. So we saw two interesting guys yesterday uh, Max and Jawed. And to compare and contrast is a really important thing because they both from here, both, uh, you know, uh, young, intelligent, worked in successive startups, had ideas, saw themselves as big picture men, blah, blah. What's the difference between the two of them? If we look at the way startups are formed, the, the, uh, the metaphor that I can use that I think is most successful is that of a military invasion. If you're going to invade another country, you know, how do you do it? What do you do? Well, there's, let's imagine that we're coming by air or by sea, and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to invade this, this other country. And the first thing we do is we send in the commandos. 
And the commandos parachute in by night, and they cut the communication infrastructure. They, they slash a few throats. They you know, take a few key trans transportation points. They put uh, uh, explosives in various places to knock things out. They prepare the, the environment for the, the real army or navy or whoever is coming in to come in. Commandos. In a startup, the commandos are the people who, who build the prototype. You know, they have the idea, they build the prototype. They get something working, however poorly. In the military invasion, the next comes in is the infantry. Infantry lands in mass, they slog it out, they climb up the beach, they, you know, they go beat the shit out of everyone, and, they, and they, they, they win the beach, they win the day, and they move inland. The, uh, the infantry equivalent are the people who take, take the prototype and truly productize it, make it into a commercial product or service that can scale, that has depth, that you know, makes sense both at my house in Madison Avenue and in their lab. And, and is a viable product. After the um, infantry lands, they move, they're headed for Paris, you know. They move inland. And on the beach, they leave behind the military police. And the military police are the people who just basically are cops and they maintain order and they, and they, uh, they build through uh, headcount and, and economies of scale. And that, that represents any successful, serious company that you can name today. You know, an IBM or an Apple or any one of those companies is definitely occupied primarily by policemen. Now, Jawad is commando. He, he quite deliberately left the company after the prototype. Because he didn't want to do that other stuff. He had, he had seen it at PayPal. And he didn't like what he saw. You know, it, didn't, it wasn't a good use of his time. It cost him half his fortune. But it was worth it to him because he still got lots of money and he'd, and he'd like to do other things. So he made a good, a good decision. And in a startup, you will find that there are people like Jawad all over the place. You have to bring them in. And, I, and this is meant as no, are you here, Jawad? No, this is meant as no disrespect to him. But their great strength is their low standards. You know, you have to get something working. You have to get something done. You have to do it no matter what. And sometimes that doesn't translate into elegance. You know, it just gets done. So, you know, you slash the throats, you throw the hand grenade. You know, you, you get it done. But then you have to turn it into something else. And that's where Max comes in. Because Max was able to, to, to transcend, to jump into the second role. You know, he was, he, was, he was a leader of commandos who was capable of becoming a leader of the, the infantry. It's very rare. You know, probably one in ten startup founders can make that jump. Max made the jump. But you notice Max bailed too, because he was unwilling to be a policeman. So these are, these are the, the roles that happen. And in your startup company, I'll tell you where they happen. The, um, uh, the first one happens, oh, you know, six months, and half the people leave. And you know why they leave? Why, why Jawad left, that he doesn't tell you? He was bored. It was done. You know, effectively it was done. As far as he was concerned, it was tidying up. You know, it was left to be done. Trivial. <laughs> tidying up. So he was bored, he, he left. Then there's people who see, who see the challenge in the second role in doing the inventory, in, in, in infantry thing, and, and, and Max was typical of that. Max was able to do that. But, but at some point, Max didn't want to be something else. And in the, in the development of startups, that moment typically happens at 75 employees. You get to 75 employees, and disaster happens. And disaster usually is in the form of CEO self-destructs. And there's no re reason for it. Uh, they see no reason. No one sees any reason. They say, the man's gone insane. What has happened? Why did he do this? And they don't, no one understands that it literally, it solely comes down to 75 employees. It has nothing to do with anything but that. 
they've met someone in the coffee room who works for the company that they never knew. That's it. it. Something snaps. And right at that moment, they blow up. Because it's no longer their company. They envision the company as, as emb embodying themselves. They are the personification of the company. They are the godhead. And this guy, having a double latte here, I don't know him. And that in itself causes a problem. Now, some people are able to transcend that. And they move on. You know, if we, Steve Jobs, for example, you know, was able to transcend that. It took him a lot of effort to do that. But he was able to transcend that. Michael Dell was able to transcend that. A lot of people are able to transcend that. But for the most part, the people we're describing are not techies. You know, Michael Dell could assemble a PC, but he couldn't design it. Uh, Steve Jobs couldn't even assemble it. But he, can, but he can inspire, he can lead, he can choose, he can kick ass. You know, he can do the things that he has to do to get the job done. And he understands that, that police role very, 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 very well. So this is what you're going to face in doing a startup. You'll have an idea. The idea will always have to be abandoned. The idea is always wrong. Now, I'm sorry. And, and, and probably half the startups that fail, fail because they're unwilling to make that shift. You have to come to a decision at one point where you decide, do we want to do this, not what we now know to be a bad idea? You know, is it beaming money from Palm Pilots? Or do we want to create a company? If you decide that you like being with the people you're with and you, you still have 12 bucks in the bank and you want to make something of it, then you, then you throw out the old idea, but keep the structure and build something new based on the knowledge base that you have. That always happens. Half the companies don't make it. The ones that do go through, weather that transition, continue to exist, and there you are. Then you'll get um, the point where the, the, the funding issue, you know, are we funded, aren't we funded? You have to do the dance on Sand Hill Road or we're still, you know, Champagne Road, wherever that is. And, and, and it's demoralizing and it's terrible because um, venture capitalists are for the most part, and I know hundreds of venture capitalists, venture capitalists are for the most part stupid. Really, really stupid. They are frat boys. They played sports. <laughs> they wear penny loafers without socks. But they understand deals and closing and presentations. And they manage to put themselves in a position where they can pass judgment on you. And they will, ruthlessly, because their job is nearly always to say no. A typical venture capitalist on Sand Hill Road in, in uh, Menlo Park will see 800 to 1,000 presentations a year and will say yes twice. 500 to 1 against that VC saying yes. So you can't bring a lot of ego with you in the room. But at the same time, you have to have your game on because eventually one of them will say yes. Cisco Systems. I mean, think about this idea. Cisco Systems. The best idea, best people, best situation, best moment in time in the world took 78 VCs to get one who would invest. Are you up to talking to 78 people before and hear 77 no's? That's tough. That's very, very difficult. And you have to find someone in your team who is willing to do that. Or else, you know, don't go the VC route. But most do. You know, you say, oh, we're gonna, you know, they're going to they're gonna fight for our stuff. No, because it's easier in their power structure to say no than to say yes. Yes requires defense. No requires nothing. They just say, well, I don't think so. Did you see what he was wearing? It, VC funding is extremely difficult to get, but it's, it, it's important for certain things. If you can do without it, I'd recommend you doing without it. 
Certainly, I would absolutely recommend you do without it as long as you possibly can. Because the more complete the idea, the more complete the project you bring into the room, the more equity you've carried in with you and the more you'll retain on the way out. If you have a great idea and you, you have lunch with the right VC at the right moment, he'll give you a check and you will discover that you have given away nearly all of your company. And you'll feel good for a while and you'll buy a car. And then you'll suddenly realize that someone else got really rich because of your idea. So borrow, you know, get investment from family and friends. Get, go, to, go to, you know, Uncle Jimmy. You know, do, do, do whatever you have to do to keep it small and to continue development to the latest possible point you can before you decide that you need to go for the real bucks. And the real bucks are intended primarily for marketing and sales. You know, it's to sell this thing. If, it, if you're doing something so grand that it requires millions of dollars to develop, well, I suppose that's different. But those startups don't happen very often. And they won't happen very much in this room because this room is definitely a software room. You know, software and services are what it's about here. I have a hardware presentation to give you, which is insane, but it's an example. And so these are my recommend recommendations. You know, having said that, do I say don't do it? No, of course not. Do it. You know, do it first of all. Do it to fail, because you got nothing to lose, and it, failure is not held against you. Failure is chalked up as experience, and that even involves failure where money was lost. So so do it, but you know. I think being involved in someone else's startup can also be very valuable. Because for, for one thing, it's like being an uncle. You know, you can leave. You know, it's not, it was his idea, he says, I, you know, come help me with this thing. Sure, I'll, you know, I'll be around for a little bit, we'll do something. Learn from that. If you are seriously considering joining a startup, it's really great if the person you're joining has done it before. The funny thing is, it's almost better that they failed before than that they succeeded before. Because people who, it's very difficult to do, have a second success. I mean, you know, is Max going to succeed with Slide? My, my guess is no. No. He probably won't. Doesn't matter. He's got lots of money, you know. He's enjoying what he's doing. He's going to have other ideas because he's really addicted to this process. There are lots of people who are addicted to this process. But most people who've sold out for a billion and a half, you know, just have a hard time living the life that's required for a successful startup. But the guy who was, you know, was a part of his friend's startup and then did his own startup, and both of them failed, but he really is one of the smartest people you've ever met. And it really is a good idea. He's the guy to, to, tap, on, to tap into, because especially if the second one got funding, you know, then he's, he knows the ropes, he, he knows what not to do, or she. And, you know, I have friends, I have a friend who started a, uh, a software company funded with food stamps. And she's worth $200 million today. The U.S. Department of Agriculture, you know, this is, this is probably their greatest moment. They never knew it. So, so the startup culture is an interesting one. It's not what you expect. It's much harder and easier at the same time. Venture capitalists are, for the most part, clueless idiots. There are exceptions. Um, but, you know, even those exceptions, once they're billionaires, uh, their perception of reality changes, and they can't be trusted. Now, I have a presentation I'm going to do here to show you something, if I may. Let's see. Well, I had one. If anyone knows how I, how I make this work. Look in the trash can. How did that work? Um, I had a meeting about 15 months ago with some friends who work in an extremely large uh, internet company. And they were... Uh, complaining about something that I had written about, which was the cost of storage. 
Uh, storage is becoming increasingly expensive for data center people as, as for anyone. And um, they were seeing that their, their storage budgets were exploding and technology wasn't really keeping pace in the way that they wanted it to keep pace. For example, we've spent, uh, AMD and Intel have spent billions of dollars over the last decade increasing the um, energy efficiency of processors. No one spent any money increasing the energy efficiency of disk drives. They rely on it, they can say, oh look, watts per gigabyte because the, the aerial density has gone up, so density has improved, but, and, and therefore it looks better, but frankly, you know, it still consumes the same 16 watts it consumed before. It was always there. We're, we're spending all this money to get power supplies more efficient, storage more, uh, um, memory more efficient, processors more efficient. Really, we've, we've pretty much ignored primary storage, which is 30% typically of the power budget of a PC. And in a, in a data center, it's much greater than that. So I talked to these people, and they were explaining this, and I thought, well, you know, there must be, there must be, a, there must be an opportunity here somewhere. So I thought, and I remembered I had some friends who had developed a kind of a hyper floppy drive, which could hold a couple of gigs. And they were very interesting people, uh, Anil Nigam and Jim White. Anil was one of the founders of SciTech, which was a movable drive company that competed with iOmega. And uh, Jim worked for IBM and is, and, and actually gets royalties today from virtually every hard disk head that's manufactured. So these are real serious guys, you know. And they, and they got together about 11 years ago and came up with this idea for this hyper floppy that no one would buy. No one cared. And so it, so it sat there and languished there for a long time. They, they, they reformatted it in a variety of ways. They were trying to think about how they could make it as be a, like a memory card alternative for digital cameras, all sorts of things. So I went to them after this meeting and I said, what about if we, do, if we took your removable media and we and we made it non-removable. What if we put it inside a hard drive and built a hard drive around this? What would happen? And they said, well, this, these are engineers talking. They said, well, that's silly. You know, it's so much more superior as a removable. And I said, yeah, but what if we just made it non-removable? It was just bear with me here. And they said, well, okay. So they ran some numbers. And, and we came up with the metal foil drive. And the metal foil drive uses um, stainless steel or titanium foil disks to replace the aluminum or glass disks that are in, that are in um, disk drives today. Has one-tenth the rotary inertia of a hard disk, all these blah, 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 we come down here. Interesting enough down here, recording density on the same technology curve as the hard disk drive. Now what this means is very interesting. We have a drive that has one-tenth the rotating mass that it replaces. That means that we can use in it a smaller motor. A smaller motor is cheaper. We can design, since this is, um, the way this, this drive works is such that um, a slot in the recording head creates a vacuum that sucks dust away from the interface. So we don't have to build the drive in a clean room. Because the, the, the metal foil is so thin, we can put more platters in a disk drive. As a matter of fact, three times more. So you could have a Seagate uh, three and a half inch drive that holds 750 gigabytes. Or you can have an Antec drive that holds 2.25 terabytes. Now if you're, in the, if you're in the data center business, you're running out of storage. And if you could just replace all those drives with drives that hold three times as much, you wouldn't have to build a new data center. This is important to those guys because it takes you know, three years of planning to build a data center. So the other thing is, at present, disk drives are made by creating an aluminum platter or a glass platter and then polishing it, polishing each one individually. In this process, we can use a continuous roll material and polish it in place and then punch out disks which allow us to 
we have we have less planning to do in terms of manufacturing. You know, how many how many two and a half inch drives versus how many three and a half inch drives? Who cares? You know, it just gets bunched out of the roll rather than planning way way ahead as they do. And here we can notice the material cost that it works out to. The disc is a dollar fifty six versus three seventy five for aluminum. Guess what glass costs? Ten bucks. So a dollar fifty six versus ten dollars. It's a very significant difference if you're a manufacturer. So we have this here. A glass, everything from two and a half inch down is glass today. So this is how we do the heads in case you care about it. And what happens is it, it rotates at high speed and then there, there's an air bearing that induces a little ripple in it and that creates the right gap. And it's, it's very clever the way it works. But it can be made to use existing hard disk heads if necessary, though that's not as fun. And there you can see how it, the small fly height is induced. And here's the comparison between one aluminum or glass and one foil disc. See, we can put two in the place of one. Now, the interesting thing about this is that it means that your 30 gig iPod can be a 60 gig iPod. So here, the cost less. Now we come to power. Power is really interesting because just on the face of it, we appear to use 70% less power, 30% of the power of, a, of an existing hard drive. But there are ways to make it even better. In an enterprise drive, it can use up to 95% less power. So if you're, a, uh, if you're a data center operator and someone comes to you and says, the thing that's, that's costing you 40% of your power budget, we can drop by 95%. They'll be pretty attracted to that. Most data centers today, the older ones were designed for 100 watts per square foot. We're typically running them at 300 to 400 watts per square foot today. So older data centers can be upgraded successfully. So here's a really interesting thing. Look at the, look at the spin-up time here. Two and a half inch drive, glass drive, five seconds to spin up versus four tenths of a second to spin up. Now, if we take it down to a smaller form factor, let's say 0.85 inch, which is the smallest uh, hard drive you can get today, which uses a glass platter. If we take it down to that size, the spin up time is actually about a fifth of that. You know, it's, it's, it's less than a tenth of a second to spin it up. In that environment, that's a drive, that's a very interesting drive because it holds 10 gigs. It spins up in less than a tenth of a second. You can spin it up, read it or write it, and shut it off faster than you can read or write flash. So let's put it in a mobile phone or a digital camera. Let's Let's envision this situation where suddenly any application that was flash-based that would use more than two gigs, we can beat. We can beat it on performance. Ten gigs of flash cost $500. This drive costs 15 bucks. As a cost, you know, you're, you're, you're a mobile phone maker who wants to add video capability to your mobile phone. What are you going to do? You're going to put $500 worth of flash in it or are you going to put 15 bucks worth of drive? At the same time, we can look at the hybrid drive that's now appearing. You know, the hybrid drive is, is an essential part of Vista. Hybrid drive, if you're not familiar with it, is a hard disk drive that has a flash buffer attached to it. It makes the drive cost twice as much. And the whole idea is to save power by not accessing the hard drive so much. This uses less power than the hybrid drive, and it's faster. Hybrid drive is dead. So here we go. 90% of, of the parts in this drive are the same, come out of the same parts bin in current hard drive manufacturers. Shock resistance. There's a huge difference here. The move to, uh, to glass platters was to improve shock resistance. And they do that by, by primarily the glass platters are smoother. By going to the metal foil, we, we bring in a whole new capability, which is that the air bearing, as the head comes down, 
and compresses the air between, between the head and the surface, the surface can deform. It gets pushed away because it's flexible. Head crashes are virtually impossible to take place. You could drop this drive on the floor while it was spinning, while it was playing, and it wouldn't detect it. Another thing about this drive is it can operate at 100 degrees centigrade. Why are there no hard drives in cars? There are no hard drives in cars because the trunk of a car reaches 90 degrees centigrade. Optical drives function in cars because they can, they can survive. Hard drives don't. If you could put a hard drive in your car, would things be better or worse? Who knows? But if at least you'd like the capability to do it. If you could put a hard drive in your car, how many cars are built each year? 100 million cars. That's a 100 million unit market that didn't exist until today. Same for mobile phones. Who puts hard drives in mobile phones? Well, nobody. How many mobile phones do we make a year? A billion. There's a billion market unit, billion unit market. Right now, the market for uh, existing hard drives is 810 million platters. It'll be a billion platters next year. We could do an enterprise drive with one set of heads and a bunch of platters. Looks like a jukebox. Ultimately, when you, when you work it out in a RAID configuration, the power consumption is 15, is 5% of, of the standard enterprise drive. Here we have an interesting competitive product analysis of this drive as a tape drive replacement. Here you can see the cost per gigabyte is 20 cents versus 17 cents for the tape drive. Look at the access time, 12 milliseconds versus 72,000 milliseconds. There's a difference. All these numbers, they're terrific, you know. Basically this says this type of drive could replace tape drives. There's a $10 billion tape drive industry that will be changed by this. Now, here's, here's a, a point that I want to make. Sounds great, doesn't it? Have, there are four issued patents on this technology. There's nothing pending. They're issued. They're proven. The people who developed this have an average of 30 years experience in the industry. They have names. This is a killer application. How many venture capitalists do you think had to look at it before one would put money in it? Take a guess. 10? 20? 60? 100? What do you think? Should be one. Should be the right VC. You walk in and say, fuck, you know, let's do this. <laughs> Where, you know, how much do you need? Let me write the check. Well, that's a good question. How big a check? Though, interestingly enough, that, that is a factor for the wrong reason. We were asking for too little money. You know, because a venture capitalist does this very strange thing. They say, well, how big is our fund? Billion dollars. How many partners do we have? Ten. It's $100 million per partner. How many boards can a partner sit on productively? Eight. Twelve and a half million bucks. That's it. That's our average investment right there. Twelve and a half million bucks. You walk in and you say, as we did, we need two million dollars. And they say, no, you need twelve and a half million. <laughs> you know, you really need twelve and a half million. And you look at it and you say, well, no, 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 wait, wait, how, 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 how do we justify this? And this is very simple, you know. You want a ten million dollar valuation and, and, and we'll, we'll give you the benefit of the doubt. We'll give you a fifteen million dollar valuation. And with our 12.5 million, we own 75% of your company. Simple as that. By the way, move your stuff out of your office next week because you're fired. And that's the way that happens. So we were never able to get funding for this. It never happened. So, you know, we mortgaged our houses. We went to our, our ex-wives, you know. We did everything that we could do. And we got the money together. The product is in development. It'll appear next year. It's already been licensed by several hard drive manufacturers. It's going to be, it's going to change the world in 07 and 08. Huge, huge thing that's going to happen. It took 11 years. There was no VC money because they couldn't see it. You know, 
Welcome to reality. Now, any questions? Yes, sir. I'm sorry? 38, before we gave up. That was it? Why don't we sell to hard drive manufacturers? Uh, why didn't we go to hard drive manufacturers? Well, there's a funny thing about that. Um, Seagate looked at it and didn't see any value there. Now, why would that be? Because Seagate is spending a billion dollars to achieve by 2010 the density that we'll have next year. Not invented here. They hate it. They want, they want it to be unsuccessful because it conflicts with their development path. They put lots of money into hybrid drives. This kills hybrid drives. This kills most of the stuff that they've been working on. Yes, they could have bought it very cheaply, but they thought it was, and this happens a lot, they thought it was a better risk to hope that it fails than to invest in its success. Yes? I'm sorry, can you say that again? We started with the three and a half inch. So we're scaling down. It works fine in the three and a half inch. And I forgot to mention that because of the, uh, of the uh, material properties of the metal foil, we're able to spin this drive at a higher speed. So there's a 30,000 RPM version. And in terms of high performance computing, yes, sir. Well, don't go to the job fair. No, 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 no. No, if you, if you fail once, you can enter the job fair. In fact, it, it, the right employer ought to see that as a positive. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't see it as a negative. But most people, in my experience, get hired because of contacts with their friends. So, you know, you've got to look the year above you and see what that guy's doing and stay in touch. Because if you're good, they're going to want to bring you in. And that's the, that's the way these things tend to happen. I don't want to completely debunk job fairs, but I never got hired because of one. So. Yeah, yeah, that's what I would do. And, and you know, it, it, it just really is, uh, it's all a crapshoot. But if you don't play, you're not, you know, you can't win. I'm, I, well, I always get fired because I'm completely unmanageable. Um, I, 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 I say what I think at the wrong moments, you know. Well, that was stupid. <laughs> so, but it's good, you know, so I'm a commando. You know, and I'm in a relatively stable environment now. Uh, I work for PBS, and um, I see them once every three years. <laughs> and that does it. You know, that's cool. And it's for like 20 minutes. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, let's understand, is this, uh, you know, Jim White makes a royalty from every hard disk head made in the world. So that's not exactly, you know, coming from out of nowhere. Here's a guy who is, is an academic, and he just happens to, you know, make money, too. And, he, and so he's got this idea. No one is interested in it. It sits on the shelf for 11 years. We haul it out because I have a meeting and say, let's, let's do this. They don't want to do it. And yes, it conflicts, but the interesting thing is some of the, some of the end user partners that, we have, that we're working with, and there's some big companies, um, try desperately not to buy this. 
you know. They tried to buy anything but this. That's one of the reasons why it took us so long to get here, because they went out and they, they hired consultants and they looked all over the world. They, picked, they looked under every rock they could find to find an alternative, and they found nothing. So this is a huge fluke. You know, this is just crazy. But when you, when you run into something like that, you put your effort behind it. You know, it isn't, well, this can't work, you know, because it's two guys in Cupertino, you know. Well, it can, you know, sometimes. Yes, sir. It uses precisely the same uh, recording and, and, and whole technology is precisely the same. You know, right now it's perpendicular recording. It'll move up to hammer recording, the next, the next generation. Everything, and that's why the density is precisely the same because it's, as far as the head is concerned, it's, it's no different than an aluminum or a glass platter. It's the same magnetic substrate. It's sputtered on in the same way. It's the same thing. Yes, sir. Well, the Lisa was overpriced. It was ahead of its position in the marketplace, and they never developed a, a, a developer community around it. You know, Lisa, we, we, we thought, well, we were so smart. You know, we thought, well, this is so far ahead of its time. We'll just have to do everything, and we'll do, there was Lisa was something called 7.7, which is seven applications that would run on it, that we determined were the seven applications that people actually cared about in business. So we wrote them, and we thought, we don't need third-party developers. Well, that's a kiss of death. You know, because third-party developers come up with ideas you didn't have that expand, expand the market. But basically, it cost $10,000, you know, at a time when the price point for business machines was $3,000. And justifying spending three-plus times as much is, was just too hard. So if, if it had come out, it was a, a brilliant machine, if it had come out a little bit later, you know, if it, if it had been the Macintosh, it might have had a chance. But it was four years ahead of the Macintosh. Yes, sir. Oh, the next machine. Well, the next machine uh, had a lot of problems. It was aimed at uh, education. The education market was not large enough to solely sustain a, a computer company. Uh, Steve made a huge number of mistakes. Um, you know, the boneheaded things that guy did. You know, remember he said it will only have an optical drive. What is with this? You know, and he said no. And people started putting hard drives in, and he told them they had to stop. You know, their warranty would be violated if they put a hard drive in. Because he had, he had, you're going to have your optical drive in your backpack, and you're going to go around. The whole backpack shtick, you know, was terrible. So, Next never could get economies of scale. You know, Next lost three hundred million dollars. A, a terrible lesson. And if you look at Apple today, you can see that Apple has the tightest financials in the business. Steve learned from Next how to run Apple, and and he's. So and that's why next fail. Yes. Angel investors today are are have become a key uh, cog in the system. Angels didn't exist way back when. You know, 30 years ago there were no angels. There were barely VCs. And angel investors are, if anything, if you're going for a more a, a more formal uh, funding arrangement and you can get angel investment, I recommend it. Angel investment typically is good for around a half million dollars, and, and for these kind of, of uh, web sort of uh, applications, half a million dollars would go a long way. So I would think angel, and angel investors are terrific because they're typically uh, you know, old startup guys who are rich and fat now, and they want to, they want to vicariously uh, experience your success. So they, have, they, they actually have some wisdom, some of them, they definitely have money, uh, they have connections, and they can help you. So if you get the right, the right angels can be incredibly, incredibly helpful. And there are groups of angels around the country who work together and can do deals up to six million. So those are, those are also worth talking to. You couldn't get those for years? Well, I am an angel. So, so, you know, I sort of did my own thing. That's the way it works. It, it's a little different. It's a little different. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Um, you know, uh, key characteristics of broke startups that kept them afloat. Um, you got to have uh, uh, girlfriends or boyfriends who work. Living with parents is good. Uh, not having a car payment is really important. Um, generally speaking, when I, when I got together with the Excite Boys, there were six of them in a garage. They had each put $1,750 into the company, and which if you add it up is, I don't know, like 10000 or 12000 something like that. That's what they funded the company with. And they had gone through about 1200 of that. And, they, and it, was, it was going out at such a slow rate that they could have lasted forever, but they would never have succeeded. So you, know, you have to decide what's an appropriate expenditure. When they went for, um, uh, I, I got them their first uh, venture capitalist, who was Vinod Koshla at Kleiner Perkins. And when they went to Vinod, um, Vinod wanted them to demonstrate search on a, on a large database. And they said, we can't do that because we can't afford a hard disk big enough to support that. And so Vinod, to his credit, this is probably one of the smartest moves he ever made, was he bought them a hard drive. You know, he spent $10,000 of Kleiner Perkins' money to buy them a great big hard drive, whatever the biggest one you could get at the time. And they were able to load it with data and, sh and demonstrate that they could search. The thing that they should have done before, and 99% of VCs would just throw you out. But he was willing to, to, to work with them. In part because I brought them in and I also brought a customer. And we have a customer there and, and the technical team and you know, it all sort of came together at once. And, and so that happened and Vinod made a lot of money from that. Oh yeah, we're done. Thank you very much.